Hello, do you guys hear me? Uh, I'm doing this on StreamYards once again, and uh, I don't know if it's working. Hello, this is Gonzalo Lira speaking to you live on uh, this Friday, April 8th, 2022. And as usual, can you uh, hear me properly and hit me with a uh, plus 333 if you can, or with a where is Tiffany Dover if you can, I'd appreciate that. Uh, yeah, sorry about this. Uh, everything's okay? Okay, great. I'm looking great. Great. You guys have, are all caught up and everything seems to be working fine. Uh, yes, yes. Okay. I'm just looking at this while I'm talking to you just to make sure that everything seems copacetic. It's just so bizarre to be doing these broadcasts off of my phone. And um, some people have said that the, the, the volume was a bit all over the place on the last one. I'll try to keep the phone at an even distance throughout this broadcast. Now, a couple of little housekeeping notes. Um, number one, as usual, there's the, um, as I'm speaking to you, there's also the uh, um, Patreon subscribers or the webinar tier subscribers who are listening in. And later on, after I've completed the, uh, um, the presentation part of the broadcast, I'll post the uh, um, link to join. I'll post the link to join in the, um, in the, in the Patreon post. And you're, you're invited to join in and ask questions if you're a Patreon subscriber. And um, yeah, the other housekeeping note is that my Twitter is back. Thank goodness. It's at Real Gonzalo Lira. At Real Gonzalo Lira. And I was suspended for a week. And so now I have to be very, very careful because I figured that the next time they, um, they, they suspend me, it'll be a permanent ban. And I... I want to keep a, a Twitter presence, you know. I wish that they would have some sort of way to, like, reset the punishments. Because, you know, the first punishment is that you can't use your Twitter account for, I think it's 12 hours. Then the second time, it's a week. Then the third time, you're gone for good. And, um, by the way, because of this, I will never be able to get a blue check mark. Uh, I'd like to get a blue check mark, even though I despise the people who have a blue check mark. But I'm just a completist. I like having the little badge, you know, it just is something atavistic about it. You know, the gold star when I was in kindergarten, probably. Anyway, um, yeah, so my Twitter is back and uh, I did a long thread today about system pigs. So go check it out. I hope you enjoy it. And uh, yeah, let's talk first about the war, the war in Ukraine. Well, here I am in Kharkov. For those of you who don't know, I'll just give you a little bit of the background. I'm here in Kharkov because I came back on my birthday, the 1st of March. My actual birthday is February 29th, but this year there was no February 29th, and so I celebrated on the 1st of March. I got back here on the 1st of March from Kiev, and um, you know the city has quickly become surrounded by Russians. And the problem is that there is a healthy-sized Ukrainian army here and it's, as a practical matter, impossible to leave the city uh, because at all the checkpoints, there are several checkpoints to get through and uh, some of the roads are mined. They have put mines on them, anti-tank mines. I'm not kidding, I wish I were. And so you can't leave, you can't, there are no trains running. You know, it's, it's, you're pretty much locked in, okay? You're not moving from here. I would guess that the population may be I mean, 85 to 95 percent of the people are gone. I, I obviously can't tell you exactly how many people are gone, but the whole city is emptied out. And um, there is fighting going on outside. It's sporadic. Some neighborhoods I know have been completely destroyed. Uh, Saltivska is the famous one, which is in the northeast of the city. That suburb has been completely destroyed. Um, this city will be captured by the Russians eventually, okay? At this time, it seems that the order of battle is as follows. The Russians are dealing with um, Krematorsk. 
the Krematorsk Donetsk line. That's where the main Ukraine army is located. That's some 60,000 men. And the word is that today the main battle started. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Um, yeah, $100 for one ruble. Yeah, it's going to be that pretty soon. But anyway, I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, the main battle there at Krematorsk or around that area in southeast uh, Ukraine, it's starting today. Apparently it started. And um, the expectation is that the Russians are going to annihilate that entire army. I, I hope and pray and wish that those men would surrender because there's no hope for them to be really, to being relieved. There's no hope for them to being resupplied and being able to break out and win or at least uh, organize a retreat. They're surrounded, they're stuck, there's no possibility of relief. And the Russians have said, you know, it's surrender or die. And I think that it's going to be the latter. And I think it's a tragedy. It's a, it's a needless, senseless waste of life of young men who've got all their lives ahead of them. And I think it's, it's a complete and utter tragedy. And I wish that I could do something to stop it. There's absolutely nothing that I can do. And it, it's... It's just one of those horrifying things, you know, like a like a car accident that you watch and there's nothing that you can do about it. Mm -hmm. The problem, of course, is that you're talking about, you know, at least 60,000 men. Nobody's quite sure how many men there are there, but it's going to be a horrible battle. And the Russians have the upper hand. It's simple as that. But the leadership of the Ukrainian armed forces refuses to surrender. They insist on fighting to the death fighting to the last Ukrainian man. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just, that's just horrible. You know, when old men send young men to their deaths, I'm an old man, I'm 54. I mean, I'm not that old, but I'm pretty much getting there. And for, I mean, I could not live with myself knowing that I'd thrown away the lives of young men on a pointless battle. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the thing. But it seems to me that the the people in the Zelensky regime are truly evil. They truly are. There's no other way to explain their behavior, the decisions that they have made. The main battle at Kramatorsk, like I said, it's starting today. Once that battle is over, just as like the Mariupol, uh, Mariupol, uh, Mariupol, excuse me, battle is winding down. They're down to like something like 3,000 men, perhaps less, that are trapped in that steelworks. Those Ukrainian fighters, Azov battalion fighters, and God knows who else. Uh, the Russian engineers are even talking now of maybe just flooding the uh, the steelworks because, of course, it's right on the coast, and so it would be no trick at all to flood it because it goes down like eight levels at least. And so the Russians are talking about maybe flooding it, you know, um, and uh, that would of course kill everybody inside, drown everybody. You know, it, it, it's just a horrible situation. Mm -hmm. But anyway. That battle is winding down. The men, you understand that that fight in Mariupol, that was 15,000 uh, frontline fighters, Ukrainian frontline fighters, mostly Azov battalion. And they fought an army of about 40,000 Russians. That was a classic, you know, war of conquest kind of thing. And they slugged it out and the, you know, the, the Ukrainians lost, they lost, uh, at least 12,000 men in that in that battle. And uh, the men who are alive are in that steelworks. And the Russians now have left a, a, a smaller force of roughly, it, it's not very clear how big it is, but between seven and 10,000 men. And the other 30 odd thousand men, they've shipped them up north. They started doing this like last week, by the way, when it was clear that Mariupol was over in terms of there being any kind of real resistance. This, this is a police action. This is the mopping up. This is over. And so what's going on is the, um, the, the Russian army, they rested up, those 30,000 men, uh, men, they rested up and transported their gear and everything up north to the big battle in southeast uh, Ukraine and uh, around Krematorsk. And that is going to be the big battle. And after that battle, after the Russians have won, and they are going to win, there's... The uh, Ukrainians have no air cover whatsoever. They have no anti-missile systems whatsoever. They have no air defenses whatsoever. Uh, it, it's, you know, if the Russians really just get tired of it, they'll just start throwing in missiles and just obliterate the whole army, you know? Uh, uh, there's no way to win. And, and it's tragic. 
but that's the way it's going to go. Anyway, uh, there's that battle. Then there's going to be the battle at Nikolaev, which is sort of like in the center of the country. Um, this, this battle at Kramatorsk is more to the southeast, and this is more to the south central. Okay. There's going to be Nikolaev. There's another another big concentration of Ukrainian troops, and if those men, um, if if the the men around Kramatorsk are wiped out, then the ones at Nikolaev will likely surrender. But it's not a sure thing. It could be that there's another big fight. If there's another big fight, the Russians are going to wipe them out because it, the momentum, the battle battlefield momentum, will be on their side. And you got to remember. The Russians wiped out all of their fuel depot, their um, munitions depots. Uh, they have no possibility of reinforcement of other, other soldiers from anywhere because the soldiers that are up in Kiev, roughly, I under, as I understand it, roughly 80 to 100,000 men, they can't move. They don't have the gasoline to move. See? I mean, the Russians even wiped out their refineries. Okay? And there are some theories about that, but I'm not going to get into it because that's not really important for this conversation. The, the important thing for this conversation is that even though around Kiev there's 80 to 100,000 men, those men are essentially useless because they're sitting around in Kiev and they can't move, okay? Not in an organized way. Okay? Remember, when you want to move that number of men, it's not just the men, it's their gear, you know, their, their tanks, their trucks, their supply trucks, all this crap that they have to carry with them, okay? And so, you know, the, the, the fact that um, you've got a, a, an army of 80 to 100,000 men, but they can't move makes it useless. OK, and so it'll be Kramatorsk and then um, Nikolaev. And after Nikolaev, they're going to focus on Kharkov, where I am. And by that time, I would expect the the defending Ukrainian forces to just give up the ghost. I mean, if there's a battle here, it would be suicidal. It would be pointless. OK, and I hope it doesn't happen because, of course, if it happens, I'm going to be dead, dead in the middle of this shit. And I certainly don't want that, man. I mean, uh, you know, I, you, you look at the video coming out of um, the Donbass with uh, Patrick Lancaster, who's been doing a brilliant job of filming stuff down in Mariupol and all the rest of it. Ballsy, ballsy guy. Right. I mean, I, 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 I seriously suggest you follow his uh, his channel on YouTube. Well, you know. I'm the opposite of Patrick Lancaster. You know, I'm, I'm a chicken. I'm, I'm just a, a chicken here, just hiding out and watching this shit go down. I'm not sticking my neck out. I'm, I'm just like, you know, and on top of that, you know, I'm, I'm underground. And that's the reason I can't leave because you see, um, because of the videos I've done, I'm on wanted lists. Okay. That the SBU has put together. And, uh, it's not so much the SBU. The SBU has limited numbers of people at this time. But what's going on is that there are a lot of um, basically thugs, gangsters, criminal elements that are working with the SBU. The SBU is the um, Zelensky regime's version of the KGB, you know, the secret police. And these thugs, these criminal elements, sort of like do a lot of the dirty work for the SBU, like snatch people and deliver them to the SBU, that kind of thing. Okay. And so that's my concern at this time, that I'll get snatched up by one of these thugs. And so, you know, and you never know. I mean, the thugs, they're not wearing a uniform, okay? So you got to keep your eyes peeled. You know, it's, it's, it's a scary situation. And I'm underground. They've already come looking for me at least once for sure, possibly twice. Um, the one time for sure was on the 2nd of March. And I slipped away um, because I happened to be smoking a cigarette outside. You know, and you're going to be listening to me like while I'm talking, sometimes like I sound like I'm inhaling a cigarette, but I'm actually not. It's an unlit cigarette because I'm indoors and I don't like the smell of smoke indoors, you know. Mm. Anyway, the point is um, I was outside. This is on March 2nd, the evening of March 2nd, the day after my birthday. And I was outside smoking a cigarette when a bunch of big guys came into my apartment, my apartment building. I was outside, you know, just wandering around, you know, pacing and smoking a cigarette. And then later when I went inside, uh, somebody, somebody there at the building um, stopped me and told me to get the hell out of there. They didn't speak Russian. I mean, English rather than I don't speak Russian or Ukrainian. And, and they just said one word, banderista, and pointed at the elevator. And I got the hell out of there, you know. Um, I had a, a different location that I could go to and I went there and I laid low for a few days for a little over a week. 
And then there was an incident that seemed a little weird. I went uh, shopping. And uh, when I came back, uh, shopping, food shopping, the supermarkets are open. They are open on a rotating basis. Mm -hmm. And the food is slowly running out, by the way. Although, interestingly enough, we have a huge supply of apples. I mean, holy cow, are we getting a lot of apples? Apples everywhere. Anyway, um, and I'm not crazy about apples today. It's just it's kind of pointless. But anyway, the point is I had gone to a supermarket. And when I came back with my bags, I saw just a bunch of cars. And it sort of like freaked me out. And so I just assumed, you know, just keep on going. Because the, the, the way the cars were, were, and there was one guy in particular who was just screaming on the phone, pissed off at something. And the, the place where I was, it was like an apartment block, and it was extremely isolated. And I knew that there was practically nobody, if, if not nobody at all, in the whole apartment building, okay? And uh, it just freaked me out. And so maybe I was just paranoid. Uh, maybe it was like a real thing, but I haven't been back there since. Anyway, the point is that um, I know that I'm on some list, okay? And if I go to a checkpoint, they'll probably find my name on the list, especially because of my passport. It's so unusual. It's from Chile. And so that's why I'm extremely concerned. And that's why I'm sort of like stuck here. Mm -hmm. I'm stuck here. And my family, thank goodness, is far and away, far away from here. That's the important thing. And they're perfectly fine. Uh, but in my own case, you know, I'm sort of like stuck here. And so I'm going to have to stay here until this thing is over one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I spend like a lot of time online and, and just following up on everything. And I've been following all the things that have been going on. Mm -hmm. And what's been going on is, well, the big offensive is, is starting today, right? Mm -hmm. There's also an interesting bit of news. There was a missile strike that hit Kramatorsk and it killed 30 people at the train station at Kramatorsk, which is a tragedy. All civilians, all civilians, all old people trying to get away from Kramatorsk because of course they know what's coming and they want no part of it. And they were all crowding around in the train station and this missile hit. And you know, the blue check marks, you know, there's this one guy, uh, Oliver Carroll of The Economist. You know, this Oliver Carroll guy, you know, it was just insisting that it was the Russians who did it. The Russians did it, right? And the thing is, see, the, there was a piece of the missile that was found, okay? And because of testimony of different people, they know where the missile was shot from. Number one, it was shot from area controlled by Ukraine. And number two, which was much more damning than that, was that the piece of the missile that fell was a Tachka, Tachka U missile. Now, the Tachka U missile is a missile from the Soviet era, and it's definitely Ukrainian. The Russians don't use it anymore. Mm -hmm. they, they don't have any active Tachka use. Okay. So the fact that it was shot from an area controlled by Ukraine, and it's a Tachka missile. And by the way, it's known that the Russians do not have it, and they didn't bring any. I mean, they don't, they just don't have it. Okay. But the Ukrainians definitely do. And the number of Tochka U missiles, they have about 90 of them before the war started. Nobody's quite sure how many they shot, but a few weeks ago, about a month ago at this point, really, they shot one of these Tochka U missiles into the middle of the city of Donetsk, where there was no military target whatsoever, with um, cluster munition. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the little pellets that when they, when they explode, they shoot these little pellets all over the place. It's like a shotgun blast, but like a missile. And, you know, it kills everybody. These little things are designed to kill people, not, not tanks, because that, these little pellets will hit a tank and just bounce off. You know, it's not going to pierce the tank's armor, but it'll kill everybody, you know. And, and that's the point of it. And that's the kind of missile that they shot at Donetsk. And in Donetsk, there was, you know, no, um, no military target whatsoever, no building that was military or, or necessary for the, military, for the Russian military infrastructure. They just shot it just to kill civilians. You know, that's what they did in Donetsk. And that's a fact. And of course, the Western media doesn't report that. And now where there's indisputable proof that this missile was definitely Ukraine, because what happened was that the missile landed, killed a bunch of people, but immediately people started filming uh, the pieces that remained of the missile, okay, the, the lower stages of the missile for some reason. And people are saying that the missile might have broken apart in midair, who knows. The point is that there's a big chunk of it that they shot that they shot pictures of it right when it happened. I mean, within seconds, 
of, of the whole thing, right? Because it landed in the middle of, um, right in front of a, of a government building, you know, in the grass, right in front. I mean, it was like, you can't miss it kind of thing, right? And uh, they took a whole bunch of pictures of it. It's definitely a Tachka U uh, missile, definitely shot from Ukrainian held territory. And the blue check marks are saying that it's Russian. They're, they're lying their asses off. And, I, you know, I, I, on YouTube, because I don't have Fox TV or let alone CNBC or any of the rest of it, you know, I see all the bullshit that they're talking about. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? They talk about uh, Bucha. And it's, it's like they're talking about something from another planet. Because on this planet, everyone knows that the Ukrainian uh, armed forces did it. it. Everyone knows. It was a safari tactical group uh, of, the, uh, of the Ukraine armed forces. And the safari group went and looked for everyone who was considered a pro-Russian traitor, whatever, and killed them all. And killed them all in basements, shot them, tied them up. Sometimes they tied them up with the very white cloths that uh, the Russians used to distinguish firm from foe. Because a lot of these civilians, you notice, had white armbands in the Bucha massacre. And that, see, the, the Ukrainians used blue and yellow to distinguish friend from, friend from, flo, friend from foe. Sorry about that. Whereas the um, Russians used white, white on the arm and white on the thigh. And so a lot of civilians had these uh, white armbands. And those were the ones who were shot. And some of them had their hands tied behind their back using the white cloth that the Russians had given them to distinguish friend from foe. Mm -hmm. Like there's like this, this alleyway in uh, Bucha where there's a bunch of bodies lying there with like all this trash. And you start looking at the trash and you realize a lot of them are MREs, uh, meals ready to eat, that were handed out by the Russians. They are Russian MREs. And uh, the Russians, what they do uh, is that a lot of times they'll just head out a lot of MREs to... Um, to civilians in, in civilian areas that they control. And so these civilians were clearly uh, friendly to the Russians and they were shot up. And, and why would the Russians give them food and then shoot them? That doesn't make any sense, okay? It doesn't make any sense also because the mayor of the town declared on the 31st of March that Bucha was completely cleared. By the way, it's not really a town, it's more like a suburb of Kiev. And the whole place was totally cleared out and it's not that big. Okay, and these streets where they found these bodies, they're the major streets. And so it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense that on March 30th, the Russians pulled out completely. March 31st, the mayor said everything is hunky-dory. The 1st of April, it's announced on a website how the safari group is going to go in there and look for any booby traps and also any collaborators and conduct a cleaning, quote unquote. And then two days after that, a whole bunch of bodies show up on the street. I mean, we know what happened. And yet in the West, they keep insisting that it's Russia, that Russians did it. I'm not pro-Russian. I'm pro-truth. Don't go telling me lies about things that I know. I mean, it just bothers me to no end. But anyway, the, the, the point I wanted to make here is that the same bullshit that they're pushing on Bucha, they're pushing with this missile, missile in Krematorsk, right? Mm. The, the Russians did, the Russians did, the Russians did. No, they didn't. Mm. And the evidence is indisputable, but they're going to keep on lying about it because, you know, in the empire of lies, telling the truth is a crime. OK, you know, I say this on Twitter and they're going to deplatform me. I say this on YouTube and it's likely that they, they will, you know, do something to my channel because that's the way these fuckers are. They are afraid of the truth. And I'm sick and tired of it. I'm just sick and tired of having to like. Oh, be careful, you know, don't say this, don't say that. You know, I lived in the Pinochet dictatorship, a fucking dictatorship, and, and they didn't make any bones about it. I lived during the Pinochet dictatorship for what, altogether about six years? Uh, no, actually, no, I lived in the 70s, well, I was a little kid, so altogether about eight years. And I feel more afraid now online than I did under the Pinochet dictatorship. And I certainly feel more scared here uh, you know, with the fucking goon squad of these SBU thugs here in Ukraine than I ever felt in Chile during the Pinochet dictatorship. And in the Pinochet dictatorship, I actually went to uh, anti-Pinochet protests and I wasn't afraid at all. And the reason I went to the uh, anti-Pinochet protests might have not have been the most noble. I was 
basically chasing girls, but what, what the fuck? Come on, man. You know, you're 19. What the hell? You know, you don't give a shit about politics. You just want to get laid, man, right? So anyway, that's for another story. The point. Um, the West, the empire of lies, I am no longer calling them the Western democracies. They are the Western regimes. They are the empire of lies because all they tell are lies all the time. Everything that they say by definition is a lie. When they say hello, it's a lie. Mm -hmm. Understand that. That's the way it is in the West. The Western regimes are lying all the time. <sighs> okay. Now let's let's get into the main uh, uh, main gist of today's uh, talk. Right. Uh, basically, uh, this is the title of it. I said that Russia and the United States miscalculated in this war. This is a true statement because you have to understand, first of all, that this really is a hybrid global war. OK, this is a war taking place on multiple fronts. It's taking place on military front, a political front, economic front, propaganda front. I'm part I'm a, I'm a foot soldier in the propaganda war. OK, well, maybe not a foot soldier, maybe like a major or something. Right. But, you know, in, in this information war, this is a component of this hybrid war. It's multiple. It's working on multiple levels, and you got to understand that, okay? And this war has been going on. Has been not going on really. It's been preparing for a while. The invasion of February twenty fourth. That was the official start of this new breed of war, but the sanctions were part of this war. The the kinetic war, you know, of of uh, you know armies clashing. That's part of this war. The economic war, the information war, all of this, it's happening all at the same time. And we are dividing the world between two camps, the Western regimes and the uh, Eurasian regimes. The Eurasian, I mean, the Western regimes, it's Europe and North America and Oceania, Australia, New Zealand, right? Uh, and Japan. Now, the Eurasian regimes are Russia, China, India, Pakistan, Iran, the Eurasian landmass. Okay, those are the two armies, and they are clashing. They are the, those are the two uh, uh, um, contestants in this in this war, and they are clashing on multiple levels. Now, what's interesting is to understand the mistakes that the two principal players at this time. Started out with okay because at this time Russia is the principal player on the Eurasian side. Soon enough, it's going to be China. Okay, when Taiwan becomes gets recognized by the United States, which they will do in the next you know six to twelve months, when Taiwan becomes recognized, uh, China for that that's going to be the red line for them, and China is going to go to war with the United States, and that's the main show. Okay, the China U.S. war. But right now we have the Russia-Ukraine war, which is really Russia versus NATO proxy. Okay. Now you have to understand why it's a NATO proxy. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, it's a NATO proxy for the following reason. You see, the Ukrainians, since 2014, NATO has been training Ukraine's armed forces. NATO, uh, Ukraine in 2014 had a very, very small army. Today it has an army that before the war numbered 259,000 soldiers plus an additional 350,000 men under arms that carried out different functions. There was the territorial police, there was the border guards, there was the, the regular police department. You know, all those men and women totaled some 350,000. But the actual army, the actual fighting force is 259,000 at the beginning of this war. OK, now these 259,000 had been um, trained to NATO standards. OK, it's very important that you understand that. See, the, the men, the armies here, they function under the, under the notion of interoperability. That is, NATO, because it's a, an alliance of several different countries, each of these countries' armies are taught the same, trained the same, same communication systems, same weaponry. So you can plug and play. You can pull out one, you know, group from one country's army and plug it into another and it'll work fine. Interoperability. Okay. Plug and play. The Ukrainian armed forces had been 
taught the same doctrine. The, the, all of the NATO doctrines, tactics, strategies, weapons, communications, command control, everything. Okay. And so when Russia went to war with Ukraine, Russia was really going to war with NATO by proxy. Okay. And NATO is really freaked out. And you have to wonder why hasn't NATO joined this fight? And what, what's happened is that, see, they've discovered to their dismay. They have enormous weaknesses. They have some strengths, but they have enormous weaknesses that they did not count insofar as the Russians being able to exploit. And, uh, and a lot of gear did not work up to par. A lot of issues with command and control didn't work. I mean, it's been a little bit of a mess for NATO insofar as their systems vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. Okay, and I'll get to that in a minute. But uh, what's important is that, see, the first... You know, the, the, the beginning of the war was with Russia attacking Ukraine. Now, Russia attacked Ukraine on six axes of battle. There was the um, Kiev axis, the, the Kharkov axis, the Donetsk, uh, the Donbass axis, and the Crimea Kherson axis, and the Crimea Mariupol axis, right? And so those six um, axes, axes, I think is the. the Oh, and, and I'm missing one. It doesn't matter. It's not important. The important thing is that the Russians attacked from multiple directions. Okay. Now, why were they attacking from multiple directions? They, they had the notion that the following. If they attacked only from the Donbass, that is the breakaway republics of Lugansk and Donetsk. See, if they attacked only from there, then it would be no trick at all for all of Ukraine to become a funnel for equipment and material to just flow from the West through Ukraine to that spot in the Donbass, in the, in the east of Ukraine, okay? And so they wanted to prevent that. And so what they did, they struck from the south, Crimea, north to Kherson. And from the north, you know, above Kiev, they struck south through Kiev, sort of like they didn't, of course, split the country, but they were in position where they could interdict anything flowing west. And they quickly used their missiles to establish the fact that they could hit any target in Western Ukraine. When they hit that um, train center just uh, west of Lviv, just about, uh, what was it, something like uh, 12 miles, 20 kilometers from the border with Poland, and they hit it with 30 cruise missiles all in one go. They destroyed $400 million worth of equipment and they killed, God alone knows how many foreign soldiers in one go. That just scared the shit out of NATO. They realized, fuck it, these guys can hit us anywhere they want to. And so though there's been like dribs and drabs of equipment and the, a constant talk about sending gear to the Ukrainians, the fact is that they're not really sending any. And whenever it does get through, it gets blown the fuck away, okay? And uh, because the Russians can send their cruise missiles that hit anything all over the place because they know it like the back of their hand. This isn't like foreign territory for them, you know? I mean, shit, you know, they still have the maps from the USSR when Ukraine was part of Russia or, you know, part both of them were part of the USSR, however you want to look at it. So they know everything about Ukraine. And so, and on top of that, they have some of the best human intelligence on the planet, of course, because there are a lot of people in Ukraine who are pro-Russian, okay? And it's not that the Russians have bought them or have them trapped in some honeypot or some bullshit like that. No, 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 they, they feel Russian. And they're like, yeah, I'm part of the Ukrainian thing, but fuck it, I'm Russian and I'm going to help you guys. So the point I'm trying to make is that, see, the Russians really control Ukraine. And by having these six axes of attack, right, they put pressure and pinned down all of Ukraine's army and totally threw them. I mean, they control the, the, the battlefield momentum. Now, here is where the Russians miscalculated. They thought, and it's becoming clear now, that they thought that if they came in soft, they could scare the Ukrainian political leadership into a political solution to the problem. Uh, that's becoming increasingly clear to me. Because it's only as the weeks have gone on that the Russians have upped the tempo of combat, the tempo and the intensity of combat, okay? Uh, when they started out, it was a very light touch, just tiptoeing around the country, getting into scraps and fights, but not really going to town. Mariupol, 
retrospectively, it was a turning point. Because I think that the Russians miscalculated along the following lines, and, and, and leaks coming out of Russia seem to confirm this, that that the Kremlin in particular was extremely upset with the FSB, which is the uh, intelligence service of the Russians, where, where what's his name, where um, Putin comes from. And Putin apparently was pissed off because they, the um, Russian armed forces were counting on the fact that there would be a lot of regions where the political leadership would side with the Russians. I think that they were particularly thinking of this in so far as Kharkov is concerned. And that didn't happen. Now, uh, I actually think that the FSB was kind of right because a lot of people in Kharkov are pro-Russian, but the political leadership is not. And this happens a lot of times. Like, for instance, in Utah, the, the Utah governor is, is basically a wokester, Republican, a rhino, r a Republican in name only. The people are extremely conservative, but the political leadership, though they're nominally Republican, are extremely lefty. It happens that you have political leadership that for whatever reason, you know, not corruption or anything like that, just legitimate political, you know, miscalculations and whatnot, the political leadership is uh, not quite in tune with the actual people. And I know for a fact that the people here are very pro-Russian, but the political leadership, not so much. And the Russians miscalculated. They thought that they'd get a lot of political support from a lot of political leaders in Ukraine who would side with them, and that the Kiev regime of Zelensky would freak out and sort of like quickly sue for peace and negotiated terms and whatnot. And they miscalculated. Now, let me just pause right there and turn to the United States. Now, the United States has been goading this war since, you know, since forever, uh, frankly. They really want this war to happen. They really want to have a proxy war between Ukraine and Russia, and their stated goal, and they, they make no bones about it. I mean, and it's really fucking disgusting if you think about it. They want this war to drain Russia, to just suck it dry, to just go on and on and on, to become Russia's Afghanistan. OK, now it's not going to happen for reasons that aren't really that are a little bit complicated. I'm not going to get into them in, in this broadcast. That's not really important. What's important is that the Russia, that the U.S. objective, rather, their objective, their long term goal is regime change in Russia. And they want to break up Russia into smaller pieces that are easily controllable. OK, that, that's their stated goal. Their think tanks operate on this premise that they want to break up Russia, have it be in smaller pieces. And each of these pieces can be easily exploited. They basically want to turn Russia into four versions of Ukraine. Because Ukraine is a failed state. It has been a failed state for 30 years. And the West has encouraged corruption because the corrupt politicians of the West get to feed at the trough of Ukraine. And the Ukrainian oligarchs also get to feed at the trough of Ukraine. And so nobody has any incentive to turn it into a um, legit, law-abiding, prosperous country. And the Ukrainians are the only ones who suffer because of this. They want the same fate for Russia, but of course the four Russias, they want to break it up into four pieces because they hate Russia for ethno-religious reasons that go back literally centuries, okay? But that all of these people feel very close to their marrow. I talked at length about Victoria Nuland's motivation and I explained in that, um, I think it was two and two and a half hour live stream I did about her, where Victoria Newland, who's the brains behind uh, the American effort, she's, for all intents and purposes, the true president of Ukraine. Well, Victoria Newland, you know, her father, um, Sherwin Newland, who was a famous uh, physician and, and popular science writer, he suffered a, a massive. Uh, nervous breakdown because of the treatment he had had from his own father, his grandfather, Meyer uh, Nudelman. And Meyer Nudelman had fled uh, Ukraine. He lived, you know, just uh, west of Odessa and he fled Odessa after the 1905 pogrom. And he got to America in 1907 and he never found a place for himself. And he was a small, bitter man who treated his son, his very brilliant son, Sherwin, Sherwin um, Newland, he changed his name from Noodleman to Newland. Uh, Sherwin was apparently a brilliant, well, obviously a brilliant individual. 
And so his father just bullied him and treated him relentlessly, abused him, you know, the typical. And this, you know, landed Sherwin in an insane asylum when he was 40 years old, when Victoria Newland was nine years old, a, a very impressionable age for a woman. And so Victoria Newland carries in her heart the hatred for Russia because she sees the, the, the disaster of her grandfather's life, which expressed itself in the pain and misery that befell Sherwin Newland as a result of Russia. Russia is to blame. And so she wants to hit back at Russia. She hates it. And other people, too. You have like uh, the, the, um, the uh, Ukrainian, Israeli, Cypriot oligarch and, and <laughs> criminal, basically, Ihor Kolomoisky, who manufactured Zelensky. Uh, he's also a man who hates Russia with passion. You know, and has pushed anti-Russian sentiment in, in Russia and in, in Ukraine, rather, spending a lot of money to push that anti-Ukrainian, anti-Russian sentiment. I keep mixing them up. Sorry about that. So, you know, these are ancient ancestral hatreds of this ethno-religious group, and they can't let it go. They hate Russia and they want to break it up. And they've said so repeatedly, avowedly, without any problem. And they want to turn Russia into, you know, four iterations of Ukraine. Ukraine is a shithole country. It is a whore of a country that is exploited, abused, treated like garbage. And it's poor. It's so poor. And it shouldn't be so poor. It should be, if not rich, it should be extremely, uh, um, it, it should be developing, strongly developing. It's got everything. And most important of all, it's got the brain power among the people. But that's not the case. See, and so the United States wants to destroy Russia. It decided to use Ukraine to do it. And the thing that they wanted, they goaded the Russians into the war and they were, and they, they were going to use the war as the excuse for sanctions. And these sanctions are unprecedented. This has never happened before because the United States has used sanctions as a weapon, economic sanctions to other countries in the past, most notably Iran. Iran was the first one that they started doing this with. And with Iran, you know, they, they prohibited prohibition of trading their oil and all kinds of, of measures, you know, pulling them out of SWIFT, all kinds of stuff, right? Now, all of these measures, you know, these sanctions, they crippled the Iranian economy. They certainly did. But the Americans never paid attention to the effects of these sanctions. Did they ever topple the Ayatollahs in Iran? No, they did not. Because the people in Iran felt that the West was persecuting them with these sanctions, not the Ayatollahs. And so the Iranian people, not all of them, of course, but a big chunk, they started supporting the Ayatollahs even more because they felt that their country, their government, was being persecuted by the Americans by way of these sanctions. You see? And so the, the sanctions, yeah, they kept on going against Iran, grinding down the Iranian economy, but the people kept supporting the government. Now, Iran is a large country. I do believe it has 90 million people or something like that. It is a potentially a very large economy, but in the scheme of things, it's small. And so the Americans could afford to sanction it, and it wasn't going to hurt them or anybody else, really. And so they sanctioned Iran. They sanctioned other countries like Venezuela, well, Cuba, famously, you know, going back way, way back to the 1960s, right? Early 60s. But when the approaching war came with Russia, they thought that they would use the same tools but they didn't understand the scale of Russia. And, and that's something that's pretty funny because people don't quite understand the scale of Russia. You know, lots of times they fuck it up in terms of understanding the scale of the country. Russia is huge. You know, it took me four days to cross Ukraine. Four days on a motorcycle, on, on you know, clean highways, no problem, you know. Four days to cross the country from the West End to the East End. And when you look at a map and you see Ukraine and you compare it to Russia, it's, it's like nothing. It's like so small. Russia is enormous. And what's more important is that it 
is such a dominant player in so many markets economically. It's so crucial to so many markets. It's not just agricultural. It's not just energy, oil and coal and, and, and natural gas. It's also copper. It's also nickel. It's also all kinds of other stuff. And not to mention the actual industries that the Russians have, not to mention the key component to Western agriculture, which is fertilizer. The fertilizer, the potash and urea that is necessary for industrial farming in the West, in the United States. Hmm? They weren't counting on that. They didn't look at it. They didn't realize it. They thought, you know, we're going to sanction them and we're going to break their economy. And this is where the Americans miscalculate. Now, let me go back to the Russia miscalculation. See, on February 24th, they thought, the Russians thought that they'd invade Ukraine and there'd be a substantial chunk of Ukraine that would break away, the political leadership would break away and join them. And they didn't expect that the Kiev authority would have the political backbone to really pursue a war. But what happens is that when you get led down the garden path, as the Ukrainians were by NATO and the EU, you believe your own bullshit. And you think that you're tough enough to fight the big guy, even though you really can't. And so the Ukrainians actually started fighting, fighting full out. And the Russians started fighting back full out. And eventually it devolved into Mariupol. Mariupol is the culmination of this miscalculation where the Russians thought that they could go in soft, scare the Ukrainians into a political settlement, and that'd be that. Instead, they found themselves with like a real invasion. They had to invade. And it wasn't what they were, had been thinking before of, because it was clear to me from the very beginning of this, okay, from like the, the second day, that the Russians wanted to capture Ukraine and capture the Ukrainian army. They didn't want to destroy it. And from the uh, Russians' point of view, it made complete sense because, see, the Russians, unlike the Americans, the Americans figured that they'd just destroy everything and then rebuild. But the Russians realized much more wisely and correctly that rebuilding an army, no, you can't do that. You have to work with what you got. And so you have to capture that army because if you destroy the Ukrainian army, you create a power vacuum. <coughs> And what happens is that you can potentially have all kinds of criminality, all kinds of chaos, social chaos, physical chaos. And so, you know, the, the Russians are clever. They wanted to make sure that that chaos post-war did not happen, as happened in Iraq, for instance. In Iraq, the United States Army went in there, blew up everything, and they dismantled the Iraqi army. And what happened? You had a huge power vacuum and all of a sudden you had all these trained soldiers with nothing to do. And so they joined gangs, they joined militias, and all of a sudden you've got all kinds of chaos going on in Iraq. And it's been going like that ever since, going on 20 years. You see, but the Russians, they had no intention of making that same mistake. And that's why they wanted to capture the Ukrainian army in one piece. And they didn't want to destroy it. And what happened, that was the miscalculation. They thought that the Zelensky regime would come to the table and really negotiate. They had no intention to. And there's also the other problem. You see, the Nazis around Zelensky, and they are Nazis, they realize that they can't surrender. They can't come to a peace, peace accord because then they're dead men, because then the Russians are going to snatch them and kill them. So they can't surrender. They know they have to fight to the death. And it was only at Mariupol that the Russians realized this. I think the miscalculation that they made was that they thought that they could come in strong, scare the shit out of the Ukrainian government, get them to the negotiating table, get them on track to get what they wanted, which was the two republics of Donetsk, uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, the two republics of the Donbass and Crimea, and withdraw, and that would be, you know, status quo ante, except for Crimea, which would be legally Russian forever, and the Donbass, right? But since the Ukrainians didn't go along with this plan, i.e. the Russians miscalculated, they found themselves following the logic of the war. The Ukrainians fought back hard, they fought back harder. 
it culminated in Mariupol. And all of a sudden, the Russians realized, you know, we're going to have to slug this one out, buddy. We're going to have to slug it out. And that's what happened with this new, with the end of state of uh, phase one and the beginning of phase two. You see, the invasion in and of itself was brilliant. And it really accomplished its goals in terms of breaking up the Ukraine military. The political goal was not achieved insofar as a settlement. Okay. Because that's what the Russians wanted. They didn't want this long slaw. And I think too that they calculated that they couldn't afford it politically back home. But the turning point was what happened 10 days ago. The video of those uh, Russian POWs getting uh, shot in the knees and groin and le left to bleed out and die. And also that barbaric execution of that poor boy, uh, you know, that poor Russian POW. That changed the whole tenor of the whole thing because it was barbaric. And the Ukrainians, either you want to call them Ukrainians, you want to call them the Zelensky regime forces, you want to call them the Azov battalion goons, whatever you want to call them. They're the same men, and these men have committed grotesque atrocities against the civilian population. It's obvious. On my Telegram channel today, I posted one where some asshole, you know, went up to this old, old lady. I mean, the lady looked like she's about a thousand years old, for crying out loud. And she came out thinking that they were Russian soldiers. And she was so happy to see them and all the rest of it and because she's old and blind. And she was waving this red flag, the Soviet flag, right? And um, she came out and discovered that the soldiers were Ukraine and uh, the, the Ukraine started mocking her. But they didn't I mean, at least not on video, they didn't manhandle the poor old lady because, I mean, she really looked like she was. I mean, if you told me that she was uh, 80 years old, I'd say, yeah, sure. No problem. I mean, she looked that old. Right. I mean, just so frail, poor thing. And and she's waving the, the banner around and they took it away from her, her red red flag of the Soviet Union. And they started stomping on it and they gave her food, by the way. That was the other thing. They gave her food and this old lady, this ancient lady. Oh, my God. That woman had balls, man, because they're like three young men, soldiers, fully armed. And she's this frail old lady. And she just says, no, I'm not going to take your food. And you're stomping on the flag that my parents carried during the war, you know, I mean, all kinds of balls. I mean, the, the old babushka, man, holy shit, you know. And these morons were so fucking stupid that they posted this goddamn video, okay? Which goes to show you that these guys are fucking nuts. They're crazy. They don't understand anything. They certainly don't understand anything about humanity, you know. And so the, I, the, the point I'm trying to make in the roundabout way, see, the Ukrainians aren't going to give up. And the Russians have realized this. And they realize that that was their miscalculation, that the Ukrainians are not going to give up. So they're going to wipe them out. Mm -hmm. Now, why aren't they giving up? It's because of the goons, the goons, the neo-Nazis, because they know that the, the, the Russians will give them no quarter. And so that's why the entire Ukrainian armed force is going to commit a collective suicide. You know, you know, death by cop. Yeah. Death by Russian. That's basically what's going to happen, you know. A suicide by cop, rather. Yeah, suicide by Russia, by the Russian army. And the entire Ukrainian armed force is going to be destroyed. I, I, I hate to say it. I think that the, the battle like Kramatorsk, yeah, it's going to be a butchery. And, and it's going to be something that you're going to want to sit down and weep. I mean, I'm, I would not be surprised if Russian commanders are just going to be like tearing their hair out because it's going to be the pointless and senseless death of all these young men for nothing. There's nothing to be won. The war is over. Okay. And why is it over? Well, for a very simple fact, a lot of military commentators and myself included, by the way, um, have said that the Russians came in with 190,000 soldiers. That's not true. The Russians came in with a million, 2.5 soldiers, a million, 250,000 soldiers. And you're like, no, they didn't. And I'm like, yes, they did. Why? Because they're right the fuck there. Ukraine is on the border with Russia. You, you got to like zoom out a little bit here.
because we're so used to the American mode of war that they carry their army over an ocean far, far away to fight whomever. The Russians are right the fuck there, okay? You know, the soldiers that they're pulling out of Kiev and rotating around, you think that they're going to be the same fucking soldiers? No. They're probably going to bring in like all kinds of fresh troops or they're going to take like hardened, battle-hardened units and spread them around newer units that haven't seen combat and plug those into the war down south in the southeast, right? Of course, see, the Russians have all the infrastructure, all the men, all the equipment, all the gear, all the missiles, all everything right the fuck there. And they can draw on that, okay? So, because we have this mental image that Ukraine is like floating in the sky separate from everything else. No, it's right there. Russia is right the fuck there. And I've fallen into this trap and it's only recently in the last few days that I've realized, wait, 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 wait. See, for the Ukrainians to get more gear, they have to bring it all the way from Western Europe and, and, and somehow get it through the border between Poland and Ukraine without it getting blown up by the Russians. And the Russians are consistently good at blowing shit up. And so, you know, as a practical matter, they really aren't getting much stuff. They're getting some, but not a hell of a lot, okay? They, the, the Ukrainians used to have 2,000 tanks, right? Used to. Now they're down to less than 10% of that, okay? To a couple of hundred. And the, um, and, and the uh, Americans and Europeans are trying to rustle up another 50. <laughs> they're looking around in their inventory of old Soviet uh, Warsaw Pact tanks, which are, of course, you know, they got smaller guns and they're out of debt, uh, out of shape. I mean, they're, they're uh, out of date, rather, in terms of electronics. And on top of that, they haven't been maintained properly. So getting them up to snuff is not going to be an easy task. I mean, you know, it, it, it's just a fool's errand, really. And the Ukrainians can't be resupplied. The Russians can't. They got the shit right there. It, their country is right the fuck there, all around on three sides of Ukraine, see? And so the, the point I'm trying to make is that, see, uh, you know, the Russians are gonna win no matter what. There is no way for the Ukrainians to fight them off. It's simply impossible. And on top of that, I, 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 ha I have to insist on this. The Zelensky regime is positively evil because they will sacrifice all of these young men to save their own hides. And all of these young men will die for nothing. I believe that we're going to see this titanic battle at the Krematorsk and they're going to wipe out 60,000 Ukrainian soldiers. And then there's going to be another titanic battle at Nikolaev. I, I don't think that in Nikolaev they're going to give up the ghost. It's going to go, it's going to go and then 10 rounds. And it's going to be another huge catastrophe of tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers killed for nothing. And I do believe, and this is the thing that I'm worried about, that they're going to do the same goddamn thing in Kharkov. And they're going to just level the whole fucking city. Because, you know, when you have titanic battles like that, I mean, old school World War II, just blow the shit up. Everything gets blown up, right? I mean, have you seen what the cities look like after? Have you seen Mariupol? Dude. It's just rubble, man. It's just blown the fuck away. And so uh, my terror is on a personal level. Sure, I hope this doesn't happen in Kharkov. But as a human being, as a man, and, and knowing the value of life, especially the value of the lives of young men with all the promise that they have and all their lives ahead of them, you know, I hope and pray that this doesn't happen, but I'm terrified and regretful to think that it probably will happen, that all these, all these babies, as far as I'm concerned, they're all gonna die for nothing. Because that's the thing, they're gonna die for nothing. Because the Russians, they're right there. They can endlessly resupply. And so all these poor Ukrainians are gonna get wiped out. Yeah. But it, well, what I wanna point out, you know, is that's to come. What I want to point out is the mistakes made by the Russians. They miscalculated and they've adjusted, see? And the adjustment is that it's going to be a real fight, a real war, and it is a real war, and it's going to be a war of conquest. Because I think that the Russians have made up their minds that, look, if we're going to die for this shit, if we're going to fight and there's going to be a lot of our dead, 
they're going to die for a reason. They're not going to die for nothing. We're not going to just, you know, fight this war, suffer these casualties, and then just withdraw status quo ante. Fuck that. We're going to fight, we're going to die, but we're going to take. The entire southern coast of Ukraine is now Russian. It will never, ever go back to Ukraine. I'm talking Mariupol, I'm talking Kherson, and eventually they're going to get around to Odessa. Odessa is a very important city in Russian mythology, in the, in the Russian psyche. They're not going to leave it to the Ukrainians. They're not going to let Odessa become like the, the lone port that Ukraine uses to get out. No, Ukraine is going to become a Mediterranean country, and it's going to be small. It's going to be a rump state. It might be, the capital might be in Kiev, the capital might be in Lviv, it doesn't matter. It's going to be a rump state, roughly oval shaped, roughly a third of what Ukraine is. It's going to go from Lviv all the way to Kiev. And it could be that Kiev itself is divided. If you ever look at a map, the old city of Kiev is on the west side, right? And the new suburban side is to the east side of the river because it, it's split by a river, by the river Dnieper. And so the point is, it could well be that the Russians capture all of it, all, I mean, they, they take it and they integrate it as part of Russia and everything east of Dnieper becomes part of Russia. Could be that. Um, it could be that they take, say, Kharkov, Lugansk, Donetsk, and everything on the south shore, like a, like a, like a Nike swoosh kind of shape thing. It doesn't matter. They're going to take a big, big fucking chunk of Ukraine. And it's going to be theirs forever. And they're never going to let it go. Because, because they've, too many Russians have died for it. Okay? And, and frankly, um, I also think that something else is going to happen. No Ukraine is going to come back. I think Ukrainians, a lot of Ukrainians who have left this area, the ethnic Ukrainians, they're never coming back here. Mm -mm. I know personally some Ukrainians, ethnic Ukrainians, who will never come back to an area controlled by Russians. They just won't. On, on, on principle, on, on an atavistic kind of like, I hate them so much kind of thing, they're never going to come back, okay? And so that will mean that this area of, uh, of Ukraine, where I am now, the east of it, it's going to be fully Russian. Hmm? No Ukrainians, because the Ukrainians won't want to come. And so it'll be just left to the Russians. Hmm? And I think that... Um, the future of Ukraine is not important. What I, what I want to focus on are the miscalculations. Now, I want you to understand the miscalculation that the Russians made, which is thinking that they didn't think that this was going to be a pushover, but they didn't think that the Ukrainians would have the political wherewithal to really push back against them. Okay. They, they thought that, and they miscalculated, they thought that a lot of the um, Russian uh, political leadership, that is, the ethnic Russian Ukrainian political leadership, that is, people who have a Ukrainian passport but who are ethnic Russians and have positions of political leadership here, they thought that a lot of them would side with the Russians, with the Russian army. I think that part of it was the SBU, because the SBU made it a point to target some pro-Russian politicians and kidnap them and in a couple of cases murder them early in the war. I think that that might have been a key issue. I keep talking to you about a couple of mayors. One of them is um, Vladimir uh, uh, Struk and uh, Nestor Shifrik, uh, which I've, I've mentioned in other opportunities. Uh, Nestor Shifrik was, uh, is, was, we're not sure if he's alive or not, um, a, uh, um, a deputy in parliament, a, a, a member of uh, Ukrainian parliament, and he was arrested, manhandled, threatened with murder and kicked around a little bit by SBU people, and he's since disappeared. Um, and, and Mayor Struck was assassinated. He was kidnapped from his home in front of his family, and two days later he showed up, shot through the heart, they dumped his body in the middle of the city. And that was clearly now, retrospectively, you realize it was a message to every pro-Russian Ukrainian politician, basically telling them, if you defect, you're a dead man. And so I think that that's why a lot of the political leadership, not all of it, but it was a, it was a contributing factor. A lot of the political leadership in, in Ukraine, you know, the, the small town mayors, those sorts of people, or the big city mayors, like here in, 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 um, 
in what you call Kharkov, they decided not to defect, not to side with the Russians because they were afraid. Right? And I don't blame them, quite frankly. And so that was the miscalculation that the Russians made. They thought that a lot of people would defect to their side and that a lot of cities would just surrender to them, declare themselves open to the Russian army and that everything would be hunky-dory. That didn't happen. They had to slug it out. And that was their miscalculation. And that was their adjustment. They adjusted to the situation. And the great good fortune that they had were these videos of atrocities committed to the Russian POWs. Now, in case any conspiracy-minded fool starts thinking otherwise, these were definitely Ukrainian. The, the people who shot up these Russian POWs, number one, the POWs were positively identified. They're known who they are. Number two, the people who shot up the POWs, the Ukrainian forces, they were identified too. And they're known to have been far-right extremists within the uh, armed forces of Ukraine. Number three, the location where it happened, the milk factory, that was under Ukrainian control. And it was positively identified by multiple sources independently based on the evidence from the, from the videos, the location of certain buildings and whatnot. And it was very easy to, to find it and positively identify it via Google Maps. So there is absolutely no question. It was not a false flag. The Russians didn't do it to themselves in order to drum up support at home. No, no, it was organic, okay? And, um, and the thing is, see, the Ukrainians who are abusing Russian POWs are doing it so often that, uh, you know, the, it, it's the um, number of videos, it's incredible, okay? Those videos that were shown of those kids getting kneecapped and then shot in the groin and then dying, bleeding out there, that was the most spectacular, the most cinematic, if you want to put it in those terms. I mean, I, I'm saying this, it's disgusting, but, you know, you, you see what I'm saying, the most, you know, attention grabbing. Mm -hmm. But there are others, and, and they're not so attention grabbing, perhaps, but they're equally disturbing, equally heartbreaking, because it is heartbreaking to see a fellow human being of whatever army, whatever stripe, uh, suffering like that, okay? And, you know, the Russians have probably done the exact same thing to some of the um, Azov battalion people, but they haven't shown the video. Uh, perhaps the, the Russians were smarter in that regard, because no video of atrocities committed towards Azov battalion members has, has leaked out. There have been a lot of videos of them interrogating them, which violates the Geneva Convention. But, you know, in the scheme of things, it's a fairly minor violation. But anyway, um, the point I want to make, the Russians have adjusted. And because of these videos, the Russian people and the Russian soldiers, their morale is through the roof. They are on top of this. And what's very important is that they are thinking this is going to be a war that's going to last a long time, at least another year. They are mentally prepared. What's also very important, I talked about this yesterday on the Duran, that the Ukrainian, excuse me, the Russian people who are now in positions of leadership, men between the ages of 45 and 60, they grew up during the 90s, 30 years ago. 30 years ago, they would have been between the ages of 15 and uh, what, 30, okay? And so they went through really, really rough times. I mean, hell, uh, Vladimir Putin was so broke that even as a member of the KGB during the 90s, or FSB as it became then, during the 90s, he had to work a part-time gig as a taxi driver. That's how broke he was, okay? The future president of, of Russia, right? During the 90s. And so a lot of people grew up in the 90s. People in positions of power today grew up in the 90s through very, very difficult times. And so they're not afraid of going through hard times again, okay? And this is setting an example for the younger generations, mm -hmm. the people who are in their in their early 20s through their late 30s. A lot of those men and women, but a lot of the, the, those men who are in their 30s, who had started to see you know, success, a lot of contacts with the West and whatnot, two things happened with them. Number one, a lot of that pr prosperity vanished, but they realized it wasn't their fault or even their government's fault. It was the West that pulled out with the sanctions. And the other thing that they discovered is that the West hates them. The West hates them and avowedly hates them. And that has changed the mentality of the young people drastically. The young professional people drastically. So let's look at America's miscalculation. The whole notion of the sanctions on Russia was that it was going to cripple the Russian economy. 
It was going to cripple the Russian economy. And therefore, it would make the people so antagonistic towards Putin that they would want to overthrow him. That was the calculation. In fact, that's always been the calculation with sanctions. It has never worked, ever. Okay? I mean, anybody saying that, oh, you know, this is a great plan, you know, let's put sanctions and it'll make the people throw out the government. This has never happened, ever. Look, look at Cuba. Look at Iran. Look at Venezuela. Look at any place that this has been tried. It never works, ever. Sanctions don't work. They don't. Because what happens is that it hurts the common people, but it doesn't hurt the elites. The elites in every country never get hurt by economic uh, downturns, be they natural or artificial, like the shape of these, uh, these sanctions, right? And so what happens is that, see, the common people suffer. And, you know, with an economic downturn, in that situation, a natural economic downturn, they might blame the oligarchs of their own country, the leadership of their own country. But when they know that they are being sanctioned by some foreign power that wants to fuck them over for whatever it is that their leaders are doing that the, that the Americans or Europeans don't like, they're like, fuck that. Because they feel that those foreign powers are attacking them, the people, because they are. Because sanctions only affect the people, the common people, the middle classes, the working classes, the lower classes. And so they feel that they are being attacked. And this is what happened with the sanctions. The United States imposed these sanctions. All these firms pulled out. And we all know the story, right? The ruble collapsed in value and all the rest of it. But the Russian people, they felt the West is attacking us. And then when the West started on this Russophobia, this hatred of all things Russian, which to my way of thinking, was the natural social expression of that ancient ethno-religious hatred that certain people in positions of power in the United States have towards Russia. It wasn't enough to just simply try to cripple their economy. They had to demonize Russian people because they themselves hate Russian people for ancient reasons that aren't relevant, but you know all know what they are, pogroms and whatnot. And so what happened was that, see, the Russian people, they see this hatred towards them. They see, like, for instance, you know, Finland just confiscated some artwork that's Russian. It's Russian. It's in the fucking Hermitage, right? Uh, some paintings, I forgot the name of the goddamn things, right? But they confiscated that because the Russians had loaned out these paintings, you know, you know perfectly quotidian kind of loaning out, you know? Uh, the Hermitage loaned out some paintings to some galleries in Italy and some galleries in, in Japan. And somehow these pa paintings wound up in Finland to be transferred over to Russia. And the Finns are like stealing it. And they're saying, no, we're not going to give it to you. Fuck you. And it's like, you know, well, it's our paintings and like sanctions. You know, uh, Finland is the ultimate Karen in this fucking story. I, I, they're, they're such little bitches, by the way. And if you're listening and you're Finn, I know more or less what's going on in Finland. You guys are fucking bitches. You're retarded, you know, because the Russians, they're not going to forgive you. And your economy depends on Russia. You're fools. But of course, that's the problem. These fucking people, they're so fucking arrogant. They think that they're untouchable, that nobody and nothing can hurt them, that the way things are, the richness of their lives and existence is like this magic shield that can protect them from any consequence so they can do whatever they want and have no fear whatsoever that anything bad will befall them. Well, surprise, motherfucker. This is what happened with the sanctions. And this is the great miscalculation of the Americans. They imposed all these sanctions. The ruble did fall in value. But there was one key issue. Russia is huge. Between Russia, and I've said this statistic many times before, between Russia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Russia has an intimate relationship with Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. Those four countries control 40% of the wheat export market in the world. 40 fucking percent. And it's similar numbers with barley, with oats, and we're not even talking about fucking uh, energy commodities. Mm -hmm. And even when the Americans stole 287 odd billion dollars of Russia's foreign, uh, foreign currency reserves, which they did, they stole it. That was theft. Okay, 
The same way they stole nine billion from the Afghans, who actually needed that fucking money because the Afghans are broke as fuck, and the uh, Americans stole that money. Well, the uh, Americans stole close to three hundred billion dollars of Russian money, but the Russians have more money because they've been very careful, <laughs> because they kind of like knew this shit was going to happen, and so yeah, they have they lost those three hundred billion, but they've also got close to four hundred billion squirreled away in other banks and other places. So they've got the money. So when the ruble took the huge hit, the Russian central bank was able to shore up the ruble. And of course, the Russians started saying, okay, you're going to play these games with us? Fine. You can buy our commodities, but you have to pay in rubles. You have to. We're not going to take dollars. We're not going to take euros. And by the way, this is perfectly sensible from their point of view, because see, if Russia and Europe cuts, cuts off all trade with Russia, then Russia, what is Russia going to do with its euros or dollars? Even if it gets them, the Americans and the Europeans are going to confiscate them. So they're not going to want dollars. They can't buy anything with these dollars or euros because Europe and America refuses to sell them anything. And so, you know, anything that they sell, they're going to get worthless currency that might be confiscated. So they don't want it. They want rubles. Okay. And all of a sudden, the Europeans and the Americans started realizing, holy fucking shit, what do we do? And so they doubled down instead of realizing that the hole that they were in. And even as the Europeans' prices started going up and the Americans' prices started going up, American inflation was baked in the cake from before this whole war. Okay, But this situation with Russia has just exacerbated the problem. And it's going to make it even a bigger problem, not because of the oil. Everybody's focused on the oil. Don't worry about the oil in terms of the United States. That's not the big problem. The big problem are fertilizers. The fertilizers. The United States does not produce the, the fertilizers necessary for its industrial agricultural operation. Russia does. The United States needs those. And the Americans cut it off. It's because of those fertilizers that American farms are not going to yield as much. And that's going to drive up the price of food. People in the United States are going to go hungry. In France, they're already talking about food rationing. And the French, you know, they don't push the panic button just for no goddamn reason. And when, they're all, when Macron was the one who pushed the, button, the, the panic button on this issue, and he's not going to push the panic button unless he realizes what's coming. And it is coming. In September, October, November, that's when the real price hikes, that's when the inflation, food inflation is going to go through the fucking roof because that's going to be harvest time. And what's going to happen in America? What's going to happen in Europe? No food because of no fertilizer or extremely expensive fertilizer. That was the miscalculation. That's where they fucked it up. See, the Americans, they thought that they could fuck over the Russian economy, and that it wouldn't blow back at them. There'd be no secondary effects. They thought that they could totally annihilate the Russian economy and their own economies, the American economy and the European economy, which skate away scot-free. They didn't understand the lesson of globalism. Globalism, the shit that they've been preaching for 40 odd fucking years. Globalism makes everything interconnected. If everything is interconnected, if one piece of this, such a crucial piece as Russia, gets BTFO'd, you're going to get BTFO'd. And the worst part, the worst part that must drive them up, up the fucking wall, it's that, you know, the, the reason, the real reason that the Russians didn't suffer because of these sanctions, because the, Amer the Americans, the Canadians, the Australians, the New Zealanders, and the Europeans, they cut off Russia. And they refuse to buy any products from Russia. But see, there are other countries around the world that are happy to buy their shit. In fact, need their shit, need their food, need their coal, need their oil, need their natural gas. You know, all the natural gas that was going to be shipped to Europe, you know where it's going? It's going to China. <laughs> and the Chinese are happy to take it. And on top of that, what's going on too is that, see, a lot of uh, commodities brokers are buying up Russian commodities 
and they're going to turn around and sell it back to the Americans and the Europeans. Okay, stuff like coal, for instance. The Europeans just announced that they're going to stop buying Russian coal as another sanction. See, it's not even that the Europeans are cutting off their nose to spite their face; they're cutting off their whole fucking head to spite their face. The Europeans cutting off coal. What's going to happen to that coal? Coal is very easy to transport; it doesn't spoil, obviously. You know. You just put it on to tenders, you know, train tenders, and just ship it wherever the fuck. It doesn't matter. It's easy to do, no problem. So, what are the Russians going to do? They're not going to ship their fucking coal to Europe. Fine, they'll ship it to fucking India, you know, by train. It'll take its time, of course, but it gets to India and commodities brokers in India. What are they going to do? They're going to start shopping it around, of course, and eventually wind up back in Europe. The same fucking coal. The only difference is that because of all this circ,、uh, this、uh, you know, very roundabout、um, transport, uh, uh,、um, uh, you know, transport uh, 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 path, in the end, the Europeans are probably going to pay twice as much for the same fucking coal. You see, because the Europeans and the Americans have this bizarre notion that they're the only buyers for the shit that Russia sells. The Americans and the Europeans, in a weird way, are flat earthers. They don't conceive that the world is a globe. They don't conceive that Russia, which straddles a third of the globe, can find other customers. Because to the Russians, Europe and the Americas, that's their western border. But they've got their southern and eastern border. Their southern border with India and Iran, and their eastern border with China. And the Korea and,、uh, and North Korea and South Korea, I mean, they got other customers, okay? <laughs> and, the, and the Europeans and the Americans don't seem to realize this. Do you see? Yeah, I mean, it's it's very important that you understand how you know the effects of this, how they miscalculated. And so, what did the Americans do? They doubled down. They basically did the same thing that the Russian army did, because what happened? With the invasion of Ukraine, they went in there thinking that they were going to go light, just scary but light, not really fuck up their Ukrainian shit. Just show that they had the the means to go to war, have some scuffles here and there, sure, have some real fighting going on, sure. But then they realized that holy shit, these these Ukrainians are not giving up. Fuck it, we're going to have to turn on the heat. So they did turn on the heat, just as the Americans and the Europeans turned on the heat in with the sanctions. But there's a difference. And the big difference is that see, the Russians, they had the means to turn up the heat that was a lot more forceful. Whereas the Americans, when they hit the hit the Russians with the sanctions, they went nuclear option right away. And the Russians survived that nuclear option, economically speaking, of course. And so what happened? Well, the Americans, you know, they don't have any more bullets. See. I mean, they they shot their wad,、mm-hmm. whereas the Russians, when they invaded Ukraine, they didn't shoot their wad.、Uh, they went in just a little bit, just the tip, just to see how it feels,、mm-hmm. and then they just started going more and more and more because they had more and more and more. Okay, they went in light, and that's the big difference. See, they went in a little bit、mm-hmm. light. If the Americans, with their sanctions, had been light, had been targeted. To hurt the Russians, but not annihilate their their economy, just a little bit. The Russians might have come come to the negotiating table, try, figured out you know maybe we don't want to go whole hog on these things, right? But the Americans went shock and awe on the economic sanctions, and the Russians survived it. And after that, the Americans are left with nothing. They don't have another shock and awe. I mean, the whole point of shock and awe is that you shoot your wad in the first go, and after that, well, you're supposed to have wiped out the enemy with the shock and awe, right? But if you don't, you're fucked, right? Because if the guy survives, if you give him his your best shot, and the guy survives, then you're the one who's fucked. You see? You see what's going on here? And that is what happened. The Americans shot their wand. They gave it their best shot, and the Russians took it. No problem. And the fucking ruble, which which、uh, what's his name Biden mocked and said, "Yo,、oh, it's going to be rubble from here on out." Fuck you, Joe. 
it's back. It's back. It's higher than its pre-war levels. It's, it's a, the highest it's been since November of 2021. Now, I have no doubt in my mind that a lot of that is the Russian central bank pulling out all the stops to support the ruble. I have no doubt about that. No, no responsible central banker would have done otherwise. Okay, and the Russian central bank with uh, Elvira, what's her face? Uh, very capable, very capable banker. You know, she'd know exactly what to do and how to make it happen. And um, I have no doubt that that happened. Okay, and the ruble is a relatively small international forex market, so it's it, easy for them to have manipulated. Not manipulated. That's too strong a word. Given price support to the ruble, I have no doubt that they did that. Okay, but. The point is that they were able to do it. And also, see, this kind of central bank price support for your currency, it lasts for a while, just a few days, really. You know? But if the market senses fundamental weakness, it doesn't matter how much you give it in terms of price support, the market is going to eat it alive because they're just going to you know, arbitrage what you're doing and, and skim off all the profit. I mean, you, you, you'll, just be, you'll basically get ass raped, okay? I mean, on a trading level. The the price support that the central bank has given the ruble, I think it's probably over. I mean, we, we won't know or perhaps never know. But if I had to guess, I'd say that the price support is over. And this is organic. This is the market actually pricing in the value of the ruble. Because the market realizes what anybody sensible should, should note is that Russia has all these commodities. So the commodities are backing their currency. And especially when they're coming up with this system whereby people are going to have to clock in their foreign currency and get rubles assigned to them, it's going to automatically create price support for the ruble. And the ruble is going to be basically a currency backed by commodities. It's going to be a very powerful currency. So I think a lot of people are getting into that fucking trade. I personally want to get into that goddamn trade, but for reasons I can't. It's a fucking nightmare. These fucking sanctions have screwed me up totally, right? I mean, I wish I were living like in India or China, man. That, then it'd be a cinch to get into, into the ruble. See, all those fuckers over there are getting into it. And me, no, because, you know, fuck it. I, I didn't think that this would happen because nobody in their right mind thought that the Americans would be so stupid to pull the thermonuclear option insofar as total sanctions package, okay? By the way, anybody who's following the sanctions thing, any further sanctions by the Europeans or the Americans means nothing. It's, it's like pellet gun time at this time. They shot their nuclear weapon, okay? And the Russians survived it. Now, what did the Americans have left? Nothing, nothing. And of course, they're so fucking dumb and so full of themselves, so arrogant, that they can't step back, see? So they're going to keep on doing sanctions and they're going to announce them. And we're up to what? Fifth round of sanctions? They mean nothing at this point because the Russian economy is around. The ruble is fine. And on top of that, everybody realizes that they need Russia. Russia is the truly indispensable country around the world. Not America. Russia. <laughs> like it or not. And so they're fucked. The Americans are fucked. Okay. The Europeans. <sighs> Oof. The Europeans are truly fucked. Mm -hmm. I, and that's for another, another broadcast. But anyway, I'm coming up on an hour and a half of this shit. But I want, to, I want you to understand how both sides miscalculated colossally. But see, one was able to react because the way they miscalculated, because they thought that they could go in with little effort. It wouldn't be like a real thing. With limited objectives, you know, distraction, sure, pinning down armies, sure, but they really didn't want to go on strong. They just, just the tip, just a little bit, just to see how it feels. And when they realized that this was a real fight, they just started going in deeper and getting in bigger, you know? Whereas the Americans went whole hog right at the beginning. And it didn't achieve the objective. Because in both cases, the initial approach did not achieve objectives. But see, when you shoot your wad, and it doesn't work, then you're fucked. But if you go a little bit at a time and you still got a lot, of, a, a lot of gas in the tank, then you can turn up the volume. You can turn up the volume all the way to 11 and you can make something happen. Ooh, let's see if you guys can hear this. Did, and let's see if there's more explosions. Uh, 
Did you hear that? Oh, shit. Well, they're usually coming down in, in rounds, you know, like three, four explosions at a time. So if there's more explosions, I'll, I'll, I'll race over to the window and get you to hear them. It's pretty cool. You know, it's far away. Don't worry. It's, I would guesstimate about maybe six, seven kilometers away. So we're fine for now. Anyway. Um, yeah, I think I've gone on for quite a bit. So I'm going to take, um, I'm going to wink out for just a minute so I can post this link to my Patreon supporters. And then I'm going to come back and have the patron supporters pop in for questions. So stand by. <sighs> How do I do this? Hang on. to hear me i hope um just press uh press um i don't know press gl if you can still hear me if you can hear me now that i'm back mm -hmm. i'll wait up for chat to catch up now by the way have you did you enjoy this broadcast come and take it mm. hello oh yes good 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 so everybody can hear me? Great. I'm waiting for guests from Patreon. I go to the Patreon page in the um, in the post where I put the link to this broadcast. I put the link to join as a guest. And I'm waiting for you guys to show up. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we are living in fascinating times. I'm, I'm going to vamp a little bit before the people start showing up to ask questions. But, oh, here we have some questions. Let's bring on Luis. Uh, Luis, how are you? Do you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. How's it going, man? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. How about you? Oh, come see, come see. What's on your mind? <laughs> um, I actually don't have any questions, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, okay. Uh, I love your content, man. Oh, thanks a lot. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, anyway, where are you from? Uh, me, I'm from Oregon uh, in okay. the U.S. And how's it going there? Um, can't wait to get out. <laughs> <laughs> what What are the prices like? What's gas price like and food prices like? Food prices are, I yesterday I went to the store, uh, the grocery store, uh, the food prices are higher, like a dollar mm -hmm. higher than from a lot, like last year. Mm -hmm. That's something that I noticed. I'm like, oh, it's more expensive. Okay. So it's, yeah. it's getting, it's getting no noticeable. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, good to know, Luis. You take yeah. it easy. Okay. Yeah. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Um, Arnie Hay. I, I can't pronounce it. It's on Cyrillic. So, what's on your mind? Hello. Hello. Do you hear me? Mm -mm -mm. Okay. Well, I'll I'll remove you until you sort out your thing. And Chris, oh hey, Chris, oh how's it going, man? Haven't heard you in a while. Yeah. Hi, coach. It's it's been a while. Yeah, it's been a long time. How have you been? Ups and downs, but not as much as you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But tell me about it. How's life treating you? Uh, still in Canada, and it mm -hmm. uh, seems like we're living in a parallel universe to what's going on. It's interesting Ex to watch explain. the news. It's just inter interesting to watch the news in the evening and, you know, kind of ju juxtapose that to what I can find on the Internet and to hear from you. It's different reality. It, yeah, but what's important is that what am I, what I am saying are you hearing confirmation from other sources as well? Sure. And that's kind of strange because, you know, again, watching to the official news, um, 
it's two different dimensions in scene. What are they saying in the official news, the mainstream? Well, pretty much the exact opposite that we what you're saying. Yeah, Russians are losing, Russians evil, all that good shit. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, it's kind of strange talking to you because you know before, obviously, you had certain you know people who didn't agree with your views about you know women and all that, but now you kind of seem to be the enemy of the state. So anybody participating in your webinars or talking to you, it, are these people? Or am I getting on some sort of a list to be you know surveilled just because you know I'm listening to someone saying something different than the narrative? You know, it's, yeah. It, it's gone full 1984, hasn't it? Yeah. It's... Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's it's so remarkably fast how these so-called liberal democracies went full totalitarian, not even authoritarian, totalitarian. They want to totally control everything that you think and see and hear and say. It's, dude, I, I think it's it's unbelievable. I, I, I can't believe I'm living in this time. It's, it's just incomprehensible to me. It's it's one has the feeling of being Winston in 1984 and like you know, yeah, when yeah. asked um, two quick questions. Um, sure. For a light one and a bit more complicated one. The light one is, um, what do you think about the plight of all the Ukrainian, you know, quote unquote refugees you know, going abroad? I mean, how would you how would you divide them to different groups? Because obviously, not all of them are you know fleeing from battlegrounds. I mean. Different people are leaving for different motivations, um, and will they ever go back? And what impact will they have on the country where they get into? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I think that a substantial fraction of them will never return. Okay. Yeah, I don't know the size of that fraction, but I mean, like, certainly more than a quarter. Okay. And it could be as high as three quarters, you know, in, in that range, you know. They'll never return because the Europeans are going to lay out the red carpet. And you got to keep in mind that a lot of the Ukrainians who are going are very educated, and very hardworking. And, ooh, you hit, here, listen. You guys hear that? Wow. That is that is very disturbing. Yeah, it's a little closer this time. I I guesstimate that was about four or five kilometers away. Yeah, but anyway, um, I think that a lot of them are very very educated. Uh, most of them are very educated. The the more educated left, and I think that a good portion of them will stay away forever, especially if they're from the east but don't want to live under uh, Russian control. Yeah, I think that they're going to stay away forever. And uh, Ukraine will be, well, it'll be diminished because of it. But at the same time, I think a lot of Russian people uh, from Russia will come here, you know, uh, because there'll be opportunities. And so people will come here. So, you know, it's, it's yeah. Um, Europe is going to suffer like tremendously uh, over the next couple of years. There's going to be food shortages, electrical shortages, outages, um, heating shortages it's going to be a fucking nightmare and so um i think that europe is going to have a bit of a nightmare over the next few years it could be that a lot of those ukrainians wind up leaving europe precisely because it becomes a nightmare you know and once the situation normalizes in ukraine under russian control then you know maybe they start to say well you know it wasn't so bad and i missed the whole country and stuff like that but you know who knows? There, there are too many variables at play, but at this time, I would expect at least a quarter of the population who has left to never return. And and right now, from the latest estimates, that's about four million people have left are in the West, and so at least a million of those will never come back. At least. And if you told me you had a magic ball and told me that it turned out that maybe three million of those four million never came back, I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Because yeah. there is a cynical point of view that considers that for a lot of these people, this is a golden opportunity to get out of Ukraine. That oh, a yeah. Lot these, a lot of these yes. people have not suffered or suffered very mildly from the war, but they wanted to leave for a long time because, as you say, Ukraine is a very you know impoverished and corrupt country. 
So mm. now they have the excuse and they don't even have to do a PCR to cross the border, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. So um, you're, you're exactly right. And the second question is, now everything you, you talked about today is premised on the fact that Russia's infrastructure for you know resource delivery remains intact. What are the odds of that infrastructure being compromised in some way? So in order to, you know, for Russia not to be able to deliver on the goods to other countries? Zero. As a practical matter, why would anybody, how would that happen? Like a military attack? I mean, any way for, you know, to kind of counteract what you mentioned is miscalculation. The miscalculation depends on the fact that Russia can deliver the goods elsewhere. Right. The what only that way ability? that they could do that is by military attack or by sanctioning the countries that are buyers of Russia's goods. And that's what they're doing to Pakistan and India and Sri Lanka. And it's backfiring on them. Okay. So I, I, I mean, certainly with India, it's backfired horribly. And they're trying to do this with China, but China is like, <laughs> come on, dude, what the, who the fuck you think we are? And so, you know, that's what they're trying to do. It is that's why they're sanctioning these other countries and they're sanctioning them in, in just such a ham fisted way and it's not working. Okay. I mean, in Pakistan, there's, there's some problems, but you know, like, like Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka is falling apart now. Okay. And India, India is going to give them the big fuck you very much because India really, first of all, needs Russia, number one. And number two has deep, deep ties and deep loyalty to Russia. Because Russia, over the decades, has always been a very good friend to the Indians. And so they, they, they have, like, a, a, on a popular level, they have no real need to fuck over the Russians. And every incentive to work with them at, at, on a pragmatic level and also on a, on a national psyche level kind of thing. So, yeah, no, the, the, the only way they could do it is it, the West could realistically stop this Sale, sale, sale of commodities would be to like blow up the train tracks in Russia. That's, as a practical matter, that's impossible. Interesting. Um, just a, a third question came up. Uh, maybe, um, what is your opinion about what's going on in Shanghai right now with this major lockdown? I don't know enough to be able to give an intelligent opinion. To tell you the truth, you tell me. Have you been following that? Um, a little bit. Um, there is a hypothesis that this has something to do with the internal politics you know obviously there are all sorts of you know in, in groups and they're shifting for power mm -hmm. this might be some sort of repercussions against a dissenting inner group who controls i have no China. idea but i i have no idea about that and uh, for obvious reasons i've been paying attention to what's going on here and so i could not tell you I'm sorry okay yeah. um all the best take care and uh it seems that you're not gonna be going back to the west anytime soon <laughs> no, no, it doesn't look like it. Because if they yeah. don't hold you on the, some checkpoint in Ukraine, they'll probably hold you at the airport somewhere. Well, I, I hope I slip through. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Take it All easy, Chris. You too. Bye. And hello, our, uh, Arnie. Arnie Haywood. How's it going? Hi. What's on your mind, man? Um, actually, I was... Off topic, I was wondering about uh, an older video of yours that I can't find anywhere, but uh, I really enjoyed it. And um, uh, but I've forgotten much of it. Um, okay, you're gonna have to get more precise and more to the point because there are a lot of people who'd like to talk, and it's sure kind of rude. So, what's on your mind specifically? If you don't have anything on your mind specifically, that's fine, and it's great to say hi. But you gotta respect the other other people who are waiting. Sure, I'll I'll uh, I'll step out of line and let other people talk. But thank you. Yeah, thank you. Take it easy, man. Yep. Bye. Hi, Eli um, Elijah. How's it going? Hello, Elijah. Hello, Elijah. Elijah, are you there? I guess not. Okay, let me find another person. Let me bring on Mary. Hello, Mary. How are you? Mary, do you hear me? Hello, Mary. Remember, if you're talking, unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Hello, Mary. Mm 
Mm, that's a shame. Uh, let's see. Divine insurance. And no, divine ins insurgent. Okay. Divine Hello, insurgent. Yes. Are you there? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. What's on your mind, man? Wow. Finally, uh, get to get acquainted with you. Appreciate the content. And uh, uh, dare I say it's an honor to oh, finally that's connect very with you. kind of you. But, uh, yes. Yeah, but so I'll ask the question. So um, there are some previous content that you released. Do you plan on releasing that or uploading that anywhere sometime soon? Or are you just like completely transitioned to your new persona? Oh, no, I'm going to release it. Um, but the problem is that if I don't have access to it because it's on a hard drive in my office and I don't okay. have access to my office. Fair enough. You know? Fair enough. But, yeah, I, I want to put up that content that's all, you know, sexist and misogynistic, you know, <laughs> so I can get another hit piece from uh, the Daily Beast, you know? Oh, take that as a badge of honor. Oh, man, and I thought My, it was uh, my thought last it was question is... Uh, did you get to see like that spectacular military analysis uh, by Scott Ritter? Oh yeah, I, I follow Scott all the time. He's great. He's fantastic. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I don't know. I mean, uh, wish we could have like the raw hard numbers right now, but you know, obviously, with without a doubt, you know, this is favoring the the big bear in the east, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, what I find just just so bizarre is that everybody has this this completely erroneous impression as to how the war is going, and and I'm like, don't you see it? It's it's so obvious to me, you know. And also, you know, usually a person in the war has a hard time seeing anything about the war because he's in the middle of it, but just from the information that's coming out, it's so clear what's going on, and how the yeah. Russians are decisively winning this and. And in, in the West, especially in America, they're like living in fantasy land. It's just like the, the oddest thing, to tell you the truth. I, I just can't quite understand it. Absolutely. And the last point is, is that, you know, and it's a very sound, poignant point, is that basically the winning forces don't have to, as you said, the winning forces don't have to resort to atrocities, whereas the losing forces have that, yeah. have that tendency. Yeah, so, exactly anyway, right. Thank yeah. you, Coach. You take it easy, man. Take care. Hey, Jackie, how are you? Hey, Grant, how are you? Pretty good, pretty good. What's on your mind? Well, actually, Grant, I'm calling. Maybe you made a word of encouragement. I don't like the way I've been behaving lately, listening to the lies of the Western media. I get so frustrated that I find myself throwing things <laughs> at my computer screen. I'm running around like my hair's on fire at all times. I, uh, I just talking to myself, muttering to myself. I don't like it, but I don't want to shut the news off either. So I don't know what to do. Does you you have sound a like an addict. You sound like a junkie. You know, just say no. Yes. <laughs> no, I I know the exact feeling because you, you're like so frustrated by the bullshit that you hear, and at the same time, you you can't stop listening to it. It's like a masochistic thing. Yeah, I know exactly how you feel. Okay. And, it, and but it's nothing new. I've been listening to that for, for years now, Gone. Just something about this Russia and Ukraine thing. That and it's it's just so stupidly false lying is going on. It's so stupidly so yeah. it's just I just can't believe people are this stupid. Well, it's yeah, it, it's kind of shocking because uh they are remarkably stupid, but I, that's not the part that bothers me. The part that bothers me are the smart people who know better and who are pushing the lie. I, I did a long uh, thread on Twitter just before the broadcast talking about system pigs. And that's the thing that I'm referring to, these people who know better, and yet they keep on pushing the lie. I, I just don't get it. I, I, I mean, see, when I know that I'm telling something that is not true, okay, I immediately just disavow it i just ignore it you know because it could be you could be telling something that's not true for two reasons number one you genuinely don't know the truth and number two you're lying right now if you're lying you don't want to be pushing the the the, the lie very long because you're going to get caught okay and if you're pushing a, a, something that you think is the truth but is not you're eventually going to find out what is the truth and so you want to get a, you know just forego the thing that was not true
and, and not keep on pushing it. But these people keep on pushing lies, p- pushing on uh, uh, false information. And I just don't get that mentality at all. It's just, I, I don't get it. I don't get it at all. Anyway, Jackie, the, the point is, you know, I understand exactly how you feel. And, uh, and you know, go for a walk. <laughs> yes. That's, yeah, because I, I wish I could go for a walk. I, I actually can't. It's been lovely. The, the spring weather here is just beautiful. But I can't really go for a walk. So, you know, in, in, in my steed, you should go for a walk. Go out, get some air. And, and stay away from the computer. And don't throw anything at it, for God's sake. You know? <laughs> I know, I know. And I found myself to change myself the other day. If it wasn't so bloody cold there, I would move to Moscow. I am just so <laughs> fed up with the news here. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, I, I'm following the Russian news, right? Uh, of course, in English, because I don't speak Russian. And they gen- generally tell the truth. They don't paint it like totally fictitious and false, like in the West. And I, I, it's just, it's just disappointment. That's all I feel about the West, just disappointment. Anyway, Jackie, thanks very much for, for joining me. I really appreciate taking it. Thank you my call, Ron. I'm sorry, you hear content. Thank, thank oh. you for taking my call, and thank you for your wonderful content. Oh, no, my pleasure. And thank you very much for being on. I really appreciate it. You take care now, I, okay? I shall. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey, Mac, how's it going? Mac, you there? Mac, are you there? Mm -mm. Mac, Mac is not there. Okay, so I'm going to call it a stream um, because we're coming up on two hours and I don't want to get it like over long. Um, The the final thought I want to leave you with before I go. Oh. Uh, a thing I want to tell you, you know, Zuby, the uh, podcaster, I did a podcast with him and he came out with it today. So go check it out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. What I want to tell you is that, see, there's nothing wrong with making mistakes. Mm-hmm. But what you have to do is readjust. And see, what's interesting is that these two mistakes that I've outlined insofar as the United States sanctions and the Russians and their military uh, adventure, see, One of these two parties, the Russians, they saw what they were doing and realized their mistake and tried to solve the problem. Now, in their case, solving the problem meant turning up the volume so far as their military activity, right? In so far as the Americans are concerned, the solution is very simple. The solution was to turn down the volume. They made a mistake with the sanctions. They went thermonuclear and it didn't work. And what they should have done is realize, you know, let's try to dial it back and see if we can rope the Russians in by dialing it back and pull them back into our fold and get them to do what we want. It wouldn't have worked, but that's not the point. The the point is that, see, when you make a mistake, you should try to figure out a way to counteract that mistake. And, And once you realize it's a mistake, you have to try to counteract it as quickly as possible. But for God's sakes, don't double down, see? Because, I mean, there could be that doubling down is effective. And you could say in a sense that what the Russians are doing, i.e. turning up the volume on their military activity, on, on, their, on the military intensity is doubling down, which it is. But the thing is, see, you have to realize when doubling down works like the case in the Russians, or when doubling down does not work at all, and in fact becomes counterproductive, as in the case of the Americans with sanctions. And you have to have the humility the humility to realize that you made a mistake. You see, I, I did a video uh, about this when I was doing Coach Red Pill material. There is nothing wrong with being wrong. Nothing at all. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody screws up. There's nothing wrong with being wrong. There is everything wrong with not admitting it and not trying to counteract your mistake with something reasonable, something rational, something that will correct the mistake that you made. You see, the Russians, they're correcting their mistakes and it's, it's showing, it's showing by their military success. The Americans are not, and it's showing because they and their allies, the Europeans are the ones suffering. The Russians are not suffering, you see? And so they are failing in this war. 
the last, last thought I want to leave you with. This is a war on all fronts. Don't be fooled. The United States is now at war with Russia and China. It just hasn't been declared yet with China, but with Russia, it is declared. The sanctions were the declaration of war. And this war is happening on all fronts. And at the end of the day, there are going to be two camps. And I would not be surprised that a lot of people like Jackie there was saying about moving to Moscow. A lot of people in the West are going to start leaving and going to the East. And a lot of people, excuse me, in the East are going to move to the West, like the people here in, in Ukraine, the ones I was discussing. A lot of the people in Russia who are very liberal and want, you know, they want to live in the West. There's going to be this, you know, we are polarizing as a planet, okay? And this great battle that we are in, this war that we are in, mm -hmm. we're all soldiers in it. Nobody's going to be untouched. Everybody's going to have to sacrifice for it, okay? The smart thing for you is to figure out which side you want to be on. Figure it out. Because, see, there's nothing worse than somebody who dithers when it's time to pick sides. And we are in the process of picking sides. It doesn't matter which side you pick, but if you pick a side, stick with it and go with it all the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, that's the end of my show today. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will catch you next time. Take it easy. Oh, and I forgot. Last thing. Last thing. <laughs> uh, tomorrow, Saturday, I'm going to do a dedicated show just to do Super Chats because I've gotten so many, and it's incredibly kind. And I'm looking at some people here now. Um, uh, from Matthew, uh, from Respergu, from uh, Swagata Raha, you know, all these very kind people. And I want to thank each and every one of you. And so that's why on Saturday, I'm going to do a dedicated super chat review and go through all of the super chats I've gotten. It's going to be a very long show because I've gotten a lot of super chats, but I want to catch up with all of them. Okay. Okay. Take it easy, guys.